Boa tarde, bom good dia. Afternoon, good morning, good evening. For those of us who are watching us from other places in the world, this is the fourth uh, meeting of our Rebrupi's um, debate cycles. Rebrupi is the Brazilian network for integrating um, peoples. Uh, this is a cycle in preparation for the biennial assembly of the Rebrupi. That involves all of the organizations that participate in the network. So to prepare our assembly, which is going to be held in the first week of August, we are developing a series of um, debates uh, on many themes which are covered by Rebrepi, including Brazilian um, politics and foreign policy across the, the world, involving our future uh, industrial development and uh, not only for Latin America, but for the entire South. The theme today are new rules for digital uh, economy and Brazil's participation in uh, the discussions on e-commerce. You can find this document, which was developed by Professor Lucas Tasqueto on this theme. The paper he wrote is on Rubrip's uh, internet um, page, web page. I will uh, place the address, the link, on the chat box so you can have access to the document that served as, as the basis for this uh, discussion. And to discuss this theme, we have the participation of three great experts on e-commerce, on privacy, data, and uh, digital colonialism. It's a, an honor for me because I've been working hard on this theme from a trade union perspective, but being here with these three experts is certainly going to add a lot, not only to, for those who are watching us and those who are going to watch us, but it's also very important for me too, on a personal basis. So I'd like to briefly tell you about the uh, background of the three experts. Um, if you can, if you want to read further, you please feel uh, you are our guest. But the first guest is Mariana Val Valente. She's the director of Internet Lab. She, the Internet Lab is a very important NG, uh, NGO. You can classify it as you wish, but they are fighting for democratic access to Internet, also on the issue of uh, privacy and data. At least this is the part of our work I keep uh, abreast of. There's also um, Francisco, who's a uh, who's, uh, uh, one of our brothers who's been with us for a long time. We also have uh, Sofia Escacera. She's a researcher of the uh, Transnational Institute. It's uh, an international NGO headquartered in, in the Netherlands uh, with very develop, very progressive uh, developments. And also she's a professor at 3 de Febrero University. She works, she has an expert and digital economy and the uh, labor uh, market. And also, we have the participation of Lucas Tasqueto, who's a professor of the uh, undergraduate course and his uh, postdoctorate research in the graduate uh, program in law from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And she's got a degree in foreign affairs from the University of Sao Paulo, though, he, though his uh, undergraduate degree is in law. We have some questions as uh, triggers for this debate, which are good for Latin America and Brazil, whether they are prepared to develop this new this new model for e-commerce and whether the liberalization agenda is going to allow for digital uh, visibilization of the less developed countries, or is it going to reinforce a renewed colonization, which we see in other areas, but now in the digital area? And how will Brazil, Argentina, and other Latin American countries have behaved in negotiations around e-commerce at the WTO and in the free trade agreements? And how that relates with all of this discussion around the uh, digital uh, agreements, international agreements, with the level of privacy, the level of uh, data safety uh, and security, user uh, security, uh, also concerning the big tech companies that monopolize the digital commerce sector. 
So, uh, according to the order that we have, I will invite Professor Lucas Tasqueto, who was the author of the paper, who, which has the same name of today's activity, and then I'll pass the floor to Marianne and Sophia so that we can continue with our debate. Lucas, you have the floor. I'll give you some 15 minutes, but you can speak at your will. And if you go far beyond the time allocation, I'll let you know. Perfect. No problem, Gabriel. Respect. I'll adhere to that uh, amount of time. And if uh, there's anything, just call my attention. I'll just uh, uh, finish, conclude very briefly. It's an honor for me to be participating in this encounter and also having had the chance to repeat to prepare this report, which is a report that goes for preparation for the uh, Hebripi's uh, assembly in next month. So I'd like to invite, to thank Hebripi for the invitation, also those brothers and sisters who represent Hebripi, Graciela, and Gabriel, who's also the mediator here with us. I would also like to greet Mariana and Sofia, who have so kindly accepted to participate in this encounter, and also like to greet those of us, those of you who are watching us and our live presentation as well as those who are going to be watching this presentation later on and the limited amount of time I have I'd like to make a few points about what we say when we consider e-commerce debate we had already posted on around the free trade agreement between Brazil and Chile which comes back with a small, slightly broader report and I would also like to build uh, something uh, as a brief pathways about Brazilian foreign policy in terms of internet governance and international trade and how these two fields actually meet in international negotiations on e-commerce. And the course of recent years, we have watched a deep-rooted uh, change in conditions of Brazil and an adherence in the terms of uh, trades to the regulatory model proposed by the US uh, based on the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership, the TPP and its um, provisions. So from that point, we also need to understand what this change means and the challenges that this uh, change, this about face in Brazil uh, poses to the policies that Gabriel briefly addressed in his introductory remarks. To regular increase in the use of e-commerce, we also had significant increase in the use of internet uh, communications, internet transmissions in the past decade. These data are not uh, necessarily Brazilian, but they actually reflect a certain worldwide trend after the beginning of the pandemic that has been instrumental to justify the need for international rules on e-commerce. So we have kept it abreast in recent months all of those data about increased internet use as well as increased use of e-commerce instruments and very instrumentally uh, suppose, uh, alleged uh, needs for international regulation. Now, I have been involved in this debate together with many other colleagues. We've been pointing at for quite some time because th this debate ignores on the one hand the profound inequalities both domestically and uh, in other countries, which are also replicated on the online environment, because this debate ignores the mechanisms to overcome those inequalities, meaning there's an expectation that market economy is going to naturally sort out amongst those inequalities, those gaps between countries and within countries, and what concerns internet use with social and economic consequences that uh, come out of that. So we deal with this demand, which is posed to us as a pressing need for international regulation of uh, e-commerce. And e-commerce here is seen in this broader sense. It is usually presented to us as if it were, but uh, buying and selling goods and services by means of digital platforms and uh, payments affected over digital platforms. But we're working with this agenda that's actually going to demand, to have high demands on technology um, companies for free 
flow of data. So that brings in more problematic rules in terms of international trade. And this is why we have been talking about e-commerce uh, in broader sense, uh, digital trade, digital commerce, much more than e-commerce. So Sophia has been working with data um, more, much more than, than us, but data is a gigant, giant um, characteristics because of the new technologies such as internet of things 3d printing blockchain uh, cloud computing among other technologies a sector that is highly concentrated and it brings advantages crucial advantages for those who who took a head start and therefore are in better conditions to consolidate the position it's not by coincidence that we have this very solid debate in the u.s and also in europe and we have three blocks if we gente cruxa tão forte hoje nos Estados Unidos e também no contexto europeu, porque nós temos três blocos, consideramos Estados Unidos... Podemos voltar, então? Be beleza, vou continuar aqui. E voltar a partir de onde, Gabriel? Cara, 
A última frase que pegou aqui, você tinha, assim, da transmissão, é, a última coisa que pegou, você estava comentando das, das iniciativas antitrust nos Estados Unidos. Acho que foi, teve uns dois minutos ainda depois que se perdeu da transmissão. Nossa, tá. Quer que eu comece daí para a gravação? Ou... Cara, se você conseguir pegar o fio da meada daí, acho legal. Se não, você pode continuar de onde você realmente parou. Beleza, beleza. Pode ir. Certo. Então, retomando aqui, vou tentar reconstruir o argumento, mas basicamente nós, nós discutíamos antes né, o quanto esse setor da tecnologia é um setor bastante concentrado, onde nós temos Estados Unidos, União Europeia e China, né, não nessa ordem, Estados Unidos, China, União Europeia, respondendo por, por 80% do comércio eletrônico internacional, né, assim entendido em sentido amplo, como nós tínhamos falado anteriormente. E aí eu me perguntava, e a gente se coloca isso também no relatório, né, de que maneira esses interesses específicos acabam por impactar na regulação do comércio internacional, partindo do pressuposto de que China, Estados Unidos e União Europeia possuem... A e a União Europeia têm diferentes regulatórios profiles que são distintos, que cumprem com o seu internacional... Uh, profile. So, uh, one country's position in, uh, on internet regulation and data and, and e-commerce is influenced by the domestic uh, framework, and in the U.S. case, that means ensuring efforts to consolidate their leadership uh, position, the company's uh, leadership position in the digital economy, meaning looking for an open digital market, looking for uh, guarantees and to increase uh, gains of scale for their companies. And these interests, by means of a very solid lobby, will eventually be translated in the, the US digital trade um, policy, which finds its epicenter when the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is concluded a few years back. Within that uh, framework of the TPP, we'll have this ensemble of more liberal rules on digital trade, which refer to uh, customs duties on electronic transmissions all the way to forbidding restrictions in terms of uh, free data flow and position of uh, servers in addition to a highly permissive system of personal data protection. On the one hand, we have binding rules, which are very strong when it comes to ensuring technology companies' rights, and on the other hand, and what concerns user rights, particularly when it comes to uh, privacy and personal data protection and consumer rights. We have a permissive system, a flexible system to ensure those rights. And then uh, I took a few steps back meaning we are basing ourselves on the assumption that this TPP model is now being used as a starting point for most international negotiations on this matter. And then I try to see how Brazil sees itself when it comes to internet governance issues in electronic uh, trades in, uh, from a historical point of view. Particularly in Brazilian foreign policy, internet governance has been a crucial issue for more than a decade, particularly within the UN, the UN, where Brazilian diplomats and Brazilian activists Brazilian, have historically looked uh, at ensuring network neutrality and also to, to create an internet uh, governance forum that was open to civil society. On the other hand, we had an equally active diplomacy in the realm of uh, World Trade Organization obviously with other interests since those agendas at that time would not would not be together they were acting in separate where brazil played in the first and second decade of 2000s uh, mainstreaming around the g20 in terms of assuring some basic rights for developing countries this brazilian mainstream and in internet governance 
has its uh, summit after the Snowden's revelation in 2003 of the electronic uh, espionage program from the U.S., which led the country to sponsor U.N. resolutions, also to uh, implement two multi-stakeholder multi conferences in, uh, on this issue in their own territory, one from the IGF, Internet Governance Forum, and the other one, uh, uh, World Net. And that led the country to design innovative uh, national legislation, which was the uh, civil framework on the internet. So we had Brazilian diplomacy elect in the United Nations as a privileged uh, district for those issues, and also framing uh, privacy as a human right. So that would give a tone to Brazilians' um, position and foreign policy as well as domestic policy with the um, civil society framework for the internet. And we have therefore been able to keep track in the past five years, at least gradually as of 2016 and 2017, the significant turnabout in Brazilian foreign policy for international trade and internet governance. I was providing an example that this change of position is very profound in terms of trade, uh, that a country like Brazil was also one of the symbols and the fight for intellectual property and, and public health. Uh, we see Brazil uh, with a very regrettable position to fight those challenges posed by the pandemic. And this turnabout is reflected in particular um, policies when it comes to technology starting from the Brazil-Chile free trade agreement, as we had the opportunity to discuss, which is currently being uh, discussed in Brazilian Congress, and they adopted the structure and the language of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So they were agreements that were made, uh, custom made by, for the US uh, position that was accepted by Brazil with no further modifications. We also have repercussions on the Mercosur agreement on e-commerce signed in April. So it was signed just uh, late April, and it was not uh, included in our report because of time, but it uh, comes from a similar history. When it comes to these agreements that I just mentioned, it was presented as the most ambitious agreement uh, the Brazil has ever entered into in terms of a trade. So it, it elaborates on addressing the theme, which had been included in the Brazil-Chile agreement and also in the uh, Mercosur-European Union agreement. We also have an impact of Brazilian decision on multilateral negotiations on e-commerce, um, which had, uh, at the WTO, where uh, 86 members of that organization are now included, including Brazil. And this period of time at the WTO, particularly after 2016, Brazil publicized nine documents on its position on e-trade, e-commerce. And there's a change. It might be the best scenario for us to identify this Brazilian turnabout, um, this Brazilian change of position. The first document, when we go back to debates around e-commerce at the WTO, this document um, had very great repercussions because it addressed uh, mandatory protections to users, regulatory structure that were looking at uh, consumer protection and uh, personal data protection, also to ensure network uh, neutrality with binding language and a document that posed the needs to ensure technology transfer and to ensure space for public space for public policies. And that changes every new document. Brazilians' position uh, would used to be tougher, and it comes closer, gradually closer to the US position. So Brazil moves from a defensive position in negotiating new rules on e-commerce, and it moves to this position of uh, identity of interest, whatever it means, but that was a uh, de facto agenda of identities with the one that was posed by the Trans-Pacific Partnership, meaning the interests of major technology companies' interests. So we have to ask, what explains this offensive position on Brazil? 
on Brazil's part. On the one hand, Brazil was not involved in a network of agreements, meaning there was no something like dependence on previously adopted the pathway. Brazil could move on with autonomous policies when it comes to trade and technology. Brazil does not have any offensive interest in terms of, of developing a national digital industry. I recall this report that addressed uh, this diplomat from another developing country who said, looking at Brazil with positions it has today on e-commerce, it, it seemed like we were looking at the global giant and technology, and this is certainly not the case. Brazil is not a major exporter of goods and services by means of e-commerce. We have, as an exception, some specific niches so for software export, for instance, also platforms where, when which is the case of uh, Mercado Livre, which is an Argentinian platform, also diagnostic uh, medicine and fintechs. So we are far from being a superpower in that theme. More than anything, we have a consolidated vocation of being uh, personal data suppliers with no capacity to control or even to process those data, despite the large use of those platforms, Brazilian users' use of those platforms. And that's sharp in contrast with other countries such as South Africa, who, which deliberately look at uh, set aside the time and the space to develop their own digital sectors before they start to consider negotiating rules on that. And I move towards the end, which is the debate that's more interesting for us, which is to debate on uh, to discuss the impact of that. What does it represent? We are working with a highly complex area, very broad and very technical. All of those th themes involved in it. If we look at international trade involving uh, regulations on trade in goods and services, intellectual property and trade and development. This has very solid implications for privacy, for the protection of personal data, sovereignty over those data, network safety or security, for the policy of developing innovation, and also to meet the tax challenges on digital economy based on discussion of the moratory. When we consider this agenda, these values, which are outside the realm of uh, free trade, they almost automatically move to being understood as barriers to commerce. The privacy protection measures, also uh, other security measures, are now seen as barriers to international trade. And therefore, most of the domestic regulatory autonomy is removed from those various fields. That brings uh, serious hurdles to innovative regulatory interventions in this field because it is a field that's still being um, built. We don't know what digital economy is going to become, so we're still dealing with these profound problems in terms of that activity. So we have these policy challenges uh, for Brazil and for the other developing countries, particularly for Brazil. We also have a legal, significant legal challenge, which is to reconcile the domestic uh, uh, civil rights framework on uh, personal data protection, which is close to the European model, with international commitments that are much closer to the liberal model of uh, digital trade, which is posed by the US and by the TPP uh, model. I think that's what I have to share. Gabriel, I'm sorry for extending on my time here. No problem at all, Lucas, very good intervention, and I will use this uh, argument that you posed at the end in order to start discussion with Mariana, because as you mentioned, on the one hand, we have the LGBV. On the other hand, this turn about a Brazilian foreign policy, which up to a certain point goes against what is being posed by this LGBT, which in terms of Latin America, though it is far from being perfect, it is one, one of those most harmonious nowadays with the European um, data protection law, considering the Brazilian law, concerning the turnabout of Brazilian foreign policy, all of the discussions at the global level that's been done in the US and in Europe. So I'd like to hear from you, Mariana, what do you, how do you see this scenario? What are the perspective for the protection of personal data, for the protection of privacy and personal data of common citizens in Brazil? What is the perspective in this scenario? 
where we have distinct uh, signals from foreign policy, on the other hand, from national regulation, and what are the expected impacts for the population, for political minorities concerning freedom of expression, democracy, and what are the positive and the negative impacts that uh, we could have within the Brazilian population. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thanks, hey, Bripi, for the invitation. It's super cool to listen to and to read Lucas. I have been reading Lucas for quite some time uh, also because how difficult it is to keep track of this topic, which is one of the things I'd like to address in my, uh, my interference here. As you asked, Gabriel, how to deal with these signals going different ways something that seems to be evident to me comes through Lucas presentation is that when we're talking about this topic Brazil's negotiations in e-commerce we see approximations and detachments between discussions both internally and international discussions one of the main points that it brings to me has to do with participation in the process. This is something I discussed with Lucas in the past because of his participation in some very important moments in these negotiations. This, this distance, in which includes where I work and uh, the debate of the international negotiations. You mentioned the Internet Lab in the beginning, so let me briefly address that. We work on rights and technology. I work with intellectual property from the perspective of access to knowledge, access to culture, access to health, considering intellectual property and development. But I'm talking more specifically, and Lucas speaks, uh, quite extensively about internet governance in Brazil and his text about this uh, important legislative uh, framework we have in the, in the country. And we have developed that on the basis of a broad participation and an ecosystem of organizations working in uh, research from civil society. And this point of encounter, and I include myself in that point, we do not have constant or in-depth debate about Brazil's positions in these forums, in these discussions. That has to do with a whole lot of things, difficulties uh, to participate, which have already been documented by many different people concerning the fact that those negotiations are closed and also avenues for the participation of civil society organizations. As those avenues are not ready or even paved and there are some conceptual uh, uh, things, conceptual elements. I would like to have Lucas uh, elaboration on that and also from Sofia. When it comes to nomenclature, when we speak about e-commerce, there is this uh, prevailing view uh, connected to buying and selling goods over the internet. And how it's as if the, the system of electronic trade was not connected to other issues that some other groups are discussing within the environmental digital environment. So it seems that the terms that are used in this debate are actually uh, detach us from that as if we were not discussing privacy, as if we were not discussing access and development of the digital economies more than just, uh, you know, uh, trading goods over the internet. I reflected upon this issue about this intersection between internet governance issues or internet governance discussions and e-commerce or international trade thinking and parallel about another process that happened in the 1990s which was that process around internationalizing intellect, uh, intellectual property rights. So I'd like to bring this process forth so we could think about those parallels because it's one of my research lines, so I know a little more about it. And I thought, I thought about the TRIPS negotiation, which is this intellectual property agreement 
which was uh, established uh, when the World Trade Organization started. It was one of the attachments, one of the annexes to the World Trade Organization's uh, uh, incorporation. And it does not bring many new things concerning what was in place in the previous international trade um, uh, negotiations. There are TRIPS agreement that were present in other agreements, the Berna Convention for a Copyright, a Paris Convention on Industrial Property, and considering copyrights to, to focus on a single point. Novelties brought by the TRIPS is the country's uh, obligation to protect copyright as well as software and databases. But other than that, it's very similar to the other treaties, but it puts intellectual property in the same arena as uh, international trade. It was not in the same arena before. This was not even understood as an international trade theme when the negotiations first started and the Uruguay round, the idea was that we're not going to include intellectual property in the same um, same basket here because intellectual property was seen as a hindrance to, to trade rather than as a trade theme. And there's this point by the US particularly to negotiate a treaty within the WTO because as if, if it does enter the WTO, the countries will have to negotiate everything together, like, you know, oranges with uh, access to medication. And that uh, generates lots of complexities, the negotiational uh, complexities, and also as intellectual property, when that falls under the the realm of international trade, it uh, applies to the other enforcement rules, meaning this, this uh, triggers in the international trade, economic uh, sanctions, for instance. Countries may be subjected to those sanctions if they uh, miscomply with the treaties. And I say so because Brazil was uh, very much resistant at the time to sign the TRIPS, uh, even against the very existence of the agreement. Brazil was actually leading the resistance process together with India at the time. And there was also a shift in government, and as color uh, entered the uh, national uh, government, the Brazilian resistance uh, was reduced uh, for other reasons as well. I'm simplifying the narrative, but it actually softened the resistance. And under other concerning other interests that Brazil was negotiating at the uh, WTO, TRIPS was then signed, which was not of Brazil's interest at the time. I spoke a little bit about copyright, but there were very important changes in the field of patents, particularly. And when those, that agreement is signed, that becomes a worldwide standard. Actually, all treaties that started to be negotiated after the TRIPS were actually increasing intellectual property beyond TRIPS. TRIPS became the uh, you know, standard zero. And these trade agreements that we're discussing here, when it comes to intellectual property, they are TRIPS plus. Many, uh, they're all they are always including further protections than those included originally in the TRIPS. So in order to think about this parallel with Brazilian foreign policy, an important issue to be observed is that as those treaties get signed, as those agreements get signed, it seems to be that we are developing those situations of no return. So in addition to the policy space that Lucas was referring to, that's very difficult to, to go back, to reverse to a previous point. Once those agreements are entered into, the US removed from the TPP but the United States are, the United States of Brazil removes, uh, you know, retreats from an agreement with the European Union. It's another story altogether. Most likely it's going to be a lot more difficult to happen. So I'd like to pose this as a concern in the sense that it has, we have to act now, we have to act while it's all happening and so on. So if you put it all together, when we think about this uh, turnabout in Brazilian foreign policy, as well as thinking about the difficulty to bring forth debates around privacy and the rights that are there on the table, which are very strong in Brazil eternally for this international arena. The question that comes forth is how can we increase participation if it is possible at all? 
how can we hold those discussions that advance so much in the cross, all across Brazil? We had this uh, concern with the Brazil data protection law in Brazil, which is not perfect, but it, it guarantees many things that uh, were not there before and then ensures some space for us to act on it. Many organizations are acting on it and trying to actually stretch themselves a bit too thin in terms of understanding citizen protections. But on, not only that, looking at the perspective of developing the digital economy in Brazil. How can we actually uh, make ends meet? I do not have an answer to, to that, but we seem to have, uh, we have to need, we seem to need to advance. I, I'll, I'll stop here, but perhaps during the debate, if we have some time, I perhaps would like to talk about data mining, which involves a very specific discussion which is one that we're not uh, having it internally in Brazil. Good, Mariana, thank you very much. We will get back to this uh, theme of data mining and intellectual property. And I'll pass the floor to Sofia Scacera, our Argentinian sister, who is always very active in debates, particularly with the uh, trade, wor trade uh, union world to talk about the impact on workers, on women, and uh, on democracy. Sophia, so please, I would like you to sort of, uh, you know, give us a, a fair idea of where Argentina is located in this discussion. We have focused on Brazilian foreign policy. So I'd like to know about the uh, Argentinian foreign policy debate, whether it follows a different track, whether there is any internal discussion about a new general law on data protection that will actually uh, meet or encounter the European data protection law and the scenario, uh, what are the impacts for workers and for users of the system that we have in place, which is lack of regulation uh, or insufficient that we have often. Very good, thank you. First for the invitation, I'll speak in Spanish because I feel a bit more comfortable because my, my mixture of Portuguese and Spanish is very weak. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to listen to the two of you, Lucas and Mariana. I was pleased with the analysis of the Brazilian perspective. I'm going to respond to questions. But to, to move a little forward for the presentation that Lucas made and also Mariana, I would like to clarify the negotiations around digital economy as a design of um, an international architecture of digital economy. And when we talk about digital economy, we're talking about future economy because little by little, digitalization uh, you know, was embedded in our lives, in our reality, in our jobs, in our democracy, in our social relations, in our consumption, in our entertainment. And uh, virtually everything is digital nowadays. The architecture is digital. It leads to all forms of life that we have. So when we think about international ne ne trade negotiations concerning digital economy, you have to think about this new liberal design of future economy, whatever it is, both in terms of trade and in terms of um, services, as well as jobs and citizenship and consumption and all realms of life. In this sense, the architecture that is provided by the WTO is what they have always been done, which is to impose a new liberal model on a new evolution of capitalism, which is cybernetic uh, uh, capitalism, but we could refer to it as digital capitalism. That's the first measure. So this uh, electronic e-trade uh, agenda, I like to speak about that because it, that can be confused with uh, buying and selling over the internet as Mariano was telling us. So I'd like to say digital economy agenda. That's what we're discussing. We're discussing the uh, digital economy agenda. And if we look at it more in, more in depth, we're discussing the uh, economy of the future. As I said, capitalism is evolving 
towards a new way, a new forms of digital capitalism, uh, which is very clearly described as capitalism subsumes individuals as such, and it captures this uh, surplus as people's uh, surplus conduct. They try to monetize persons conduct. And that is what helps uh, capitalism to evolve towards a technically efficient capitalism or digitally efficient capitalism. So this has to be seen with many different fronts. As Mariana mentioned, intellectual property, which is cool, uh, key, that's the heart. This uh, black box of new digital capitalism, which allows for the state of exception of no the norm. And that does not allow us to try and understand how the new, form of cap new forms of capitalism are going to be regulated. On the other hand, the e-commerce uh, economy, digital economy, which is to liberalize raw materials and data and uh, the rights and citizen protections for the citizens, for the people. But on the other hand, there are other arms which have to be taken into consideration, such as domestic regulation negotiations or investment protection regulations, which are also being taken forward uh, within the WTO and as part of this new architecture where we no longer have the rights to express our opinion about what we want as citizens, that uh, our states are going to be regulated, but the companies want that because they are always going to have more rights than we as citizens in terms of imposing what the rules of the game are going to be for tomorrow's economy so that we can actually play in the economy of tomorrow. In this sense, Brazil is included in every, every negotiation, and so is Argentina. Brazil has this difficulty with uh, Bolsonaro ahead of the government. It's difficult to say that Brazil is uh, going to get out of those negotiations. But Argentina, myself and other uh, activists are uh, pushing the government to remove from the negotiations. But it's very difficult from the geopolitical point of view, because we know though our government has been elected with broad majority. It's uh, severely hit by the pandemic. And in that sense, constant propaganda made about associating that with the country with Venezuela and Cuba, that we are the left wing, and we're looking at implementing communism and so on and so forth. It's very complicated for a government in that sense, considering abandoning WTO negotiations can be seen as Argentina together with uh, Venezuela, close to the rest of the world, and a government that has been hit in this year of uh, legislative uh, elections, which are the ones soon, coming soon in Argentina. It's very difficult to ask the government to refrain from those negotiations. So negotiation is not negotiating these agendas and it's not presented present in the uh, negotiations, which is a problem because if they are may involved in a negotiation that they will have to uh, sign, but they do not have a voice in that. So these are the negotiations we have concerning these negotiations, particularly in Argentina and in the region, Latin America in general. The e-commerce agenda we have in Mercosur for digital economy, I always say that at least public policies have, were left outside because it does not include public uh, procurement and public services. At least they allow that outside this new liberal architecture digital neoliberal architecture. But the, the region is then preparing to sign those agreements and to delve into this cybernetic uh, capitalism, this new uh, neoliberal digital capitalism, which re it reaches out to all uh, realms of economy because what this agenda is looking for is to stop paying duties on imports of digital products. And you know that by means of 3D printers, even a small uh, drawing or design for industrial uh, object can be digitally commercialized so what they consider to be e-commerce, virtually all of the economy comes into that definition, falls within that definition, because they are just looking at the marketing and sales and consumption by means of digital channels, where everything is pos possible under the framework of these negotiations. We then see that there's a new wave of digital capitalism which the WTO is trying to share this new architecture in order to liberalize everything. So your company uh, about the workers, what's the impact about 
on the workers. When we speak about new ways of production under the digital economy, the counterpart of these new forms of production are actually the new forms of labor in the digital economy. So uh, the other part of production is labor. So how production is organized, uh, that has to do with how labor is organized. In that sense, workers in digital era this has to do with uh, what Oppenheimer used to say in the WEFI, the World Economic Forum, saying that everybody is going to be jobless. And I think this is a strategy of the new liberal approach in order to force everybody to accept whatever working conditions. If the perspective is to lose your job, you will prefer to do any, any trash job rather than to be unemployed. Uh, we see that China, which is the mecca of in, uh, artificial intelligence, they gain more uh, work working positions every year. Therefore, it's fa fa fake to say that everybody's going to be jobless. The problem is what type of job is going to be there available within this new architecture of the digital economy. Developing countries such as Brazil and uh, Argentina are, are not going to be limited to being mere consumers of digital products and those central countries are going to be the producers of digital products with which we are conducting we're condemning developing countries to have less productive jobs uh, less qualified jobs and the reality also is that the labor world further than digitalization the labor world is actually is moving towards a pluri multi jobs and multi an entrepreneurship this is the entrepreneurship uh, paradise which we see that platforms is the only way we can see them it's not on, not the only way we see them but also independent professionals start to um proliferate this type of a pluri in employment many all everybody working for different objectives where we have more than one job and we're no longer hired as an institution which will which will consider all of our uh, labor history so these are the future trajectories for employment and digitalization is actually favoring all of these movement on the one hand we have multi jobs and entrepreneurship and on the other hand we have salaries which are condemned to be low salaries low quality jobs and salaries an outcome of the fact that we are going to become consumers of digital products rather than active creators of uh, products and digital solutions for ourselves or for our region this is not the only problem also uh, another crucial problem with this uh, framework that i want to to, uh, you know, I would like to come to, to try and wrap up my presentation, which is intellectual uh, property by means of this neoliberal of digital architecture. What's being achieved by that is that the law cannot achieve or cannot actually get to regulate the design of new technologies. And if we talk about technologies, whatever technology technology it is, be it a, you know, a new pencil or a, a, a bicycle or a vaccine, uh, is actually looking at uh, objectives, and that involves specific interests. In the case of digital products, we see the, the consumption interests by the major technological companies. So in this sense, we lose the capacity to design our own technology that will pursue Latin American interests in addition to uh, regulate those technologies, what they can do and what they cannot do in different territories. So it's important to understand jobs, why this lack of regulation around inter artificial intellect, uh, intelligence does not seem to be uh, reached by uh, regulation. And uh, these international um, supranational uh, agencies will, uh, will rule over that. And we also have the labor rights, which are not respected. Therefore, we have exclusion, discrimination, lack of regulation concerning uh, working hours and vacations and so on. So the law does not get that far. And it's very complex for a state to be sovereign and impose its own rules when there is a worldwide architecture which, is, which goes above domestic rules. Therefore, the labor, labor 
is going through a crisis. I don't like this discourse that we are going to be jobless, but indeed, uh, wage uh, labor with rights, as we know, it is indeed going through a crisis. There are jobs, but what we no longer have is a wage salary that will be able to which we could develop uh, through trade union fight and social movement. This is something that's being gradually lost as a result of this new architecture that's being developed where laws fall short and the only sovereign entity is technology companies rather than the states. Uh, the, the access seems to have slid, slid outside, given way to the uh, technology companies or even uh, Chinese companies such as Alibaba and others. Therefore, trade union fight, I like to share this uh, hopeful message about that. Trade union fight has advanced and today it should review the rights which were gradually lost uh, during the years, but also to try to understand that what are the new rights beyond uh, citizenship and for labors, such as the right to uh, digital access and uh, sovereignty for working hours and the right to, to workers. They are the new labors, new uh, rights. Trade union should incorporate new strategies such as cyber activism and how that uh, activism can be put together. We have to learn from the youth because they're the ones who are uh, activists without knowing so. So they're, they're doing that in a disorderly manner. So the trade unionism has to learn from these youth, from these new demands, from these new strategies uh, who are actually the main support for major technological corporations in an era where the world seems to have lost control. The world has always been uh, out of control uh, because th they are capital, but we are the world. We are the citizens. We are the workers. We are the ones who actually move the world. And this for empowering us with uh, new strategies is crucial. The financial architecture that they want to approve at the WTO is not uh, approved. It is uh, uh, so we everything is not lost. The trade union fight has to be concerned with not approving these new standards of this uh, liberal model for sovereignetic uh, capitalism. But we should look for stronger states, more powerful states that will have more sovereign capacity, that will have more industrialization capacity, with more capacity to be able to grant new rights to the population with. Uh, working uh, citizenship that will have the capacity to demand uh, the new rights uh, within the 4.0 economy. And that uh, uh, allows me to get to this uh, hopeful message that we're not doing so bad. We're not uh, you know, like rabbits that are under the demand that are under control, but rather computers are allowing us to have this encounter. So I'd like to look at technology as something that has the capacity to empower the population rather than restrict our rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sophia. It's very important to have this uh, memorandum at the end, which uh, uh, is that it is not all bad. There are platforms that are means that are actually helpful to empower us and to help our political action. So we have to have this capacity to distinguish between what's useful and what's not. What are the forms? What are the sources of control types of regulation when we're speaking about digital economy? Mariana has to leave because she has another appointment. So let's let her go. We still have a lot of topics to talk, Mariana. We please don't uh, be disheartened. We will we'll invite you again for a new debate. There are, there are lots of things to talk about. So I'd like to say that I love the work done by Internet Lab. There are many Latin American organizations in the civil society um, of very high level that work with uh, access to Internet, democracy uh, on the Internet, democracy and social control, public control of information, data, privacy, and so on. And I think it's very interesting to say here you said that you do not cover the international side of it uh, because indeed there are too many facets in the, to, to that uh, from the most international one to the most local one. 
which pervade all, all of our lives, all of the digital media, particularly in large cities. So what I'd like to say is that it's very important to have RIP and to have this type of conversation, which bring together uh, different worlds that work on similar topics, but uh, they do not always interact. And in this sense, we're interested in, in putting together a working group or creating space with organizations that will be more representative of the labor, uh, of uh, the NGOs, that will be more representative of international negotiations, the, the world of law. Many of these themes interact, but it's difficult to have a single organization that will comprise everything because they are indeed very complex and very broad themes. So it's part of our interest to establish uh, liaise with groups that work with similar themes, but they do not uh, have direct dialogue. So one of our intentions is, it has been, and it is, to keep liaising those groups, those different groups from different perspectives on, on such, uh, to convene these groups uh, around uh, coming from similar topics. Yes, I, uh, I, I would like to thank you. It's great to listen to Sofia once again. Thank you all for having this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much, Mariana. For those who stay, we have one round of question. I will pass the floor to Sofia, who also has time limitations. Can you answer this round of questions, Sophia? Do you have the time to, for that? The time for that? Yes, good. So I'll share the questions that came up through the different channels. And you please feel free to answer one question or another one if you want to change the, the approach a little bit. One of those questions is looking at uh, Brazil, and I would uh, send that to Argentina. Is there any possibility for to resume Brazilian industry in the context of the digital economy, or have we missed the opportunity, have we already missed the train of history that could put Brazil and Argentina, which I see as a little more incorporated in the industries of the digital economy, but do you think there's still a possibility for Brazil to have a Brazilian digital industry uh, with a little more relevance, or if this is a debate that we have already lost. Another question is that uh, if Brazil enters into an agreement with Chile, will that consolidate the Bra Brazilian pathway towards the, the uh, levels established by the TPP? So if by signing the agreement with Chile, does that put Brazil in the avenue towards the TPP? Or is, if, if it is one step, along that road or the other question which is geopolitical but it helps us understand the our context in latin america a good portion of the dispute between the us and the china and china does it have to do with the big tax a new big tax has just come into play which which is TikTok, which is this app that has gone viral across the world we have had many commercial conflicts between the us and china in the past because of that and the question is this um dispute for big tax is still an area where the U.S. prevails over China or uh, social networks such as uh, TikTok, are they likely to be more and more ordinary, making, making our analysis not to be restricted to big tax from the Silicon Valley? And if that is, is it important for us to look at the dynamic of Chinese big tax if they are something that has come to stay, that have come to stay, or if the U.S. will still prevail in this area over the Chinese. Those are complex questions. I think I'd open the floor for Sophia first because she has less time, so and I can stay a little longer. So we'll pass the floor immediately to Sophia. If you'd like to add other points to that analysis or to bring forth other provocations based on that, feel free to do so. Actually, those questions were more related to Brazil, so <laughs> perhaps Lucas would be able to respond more properly than myself because those questions were very much focused on Brazil. At least that's the feeling I had. Perfect, Gabriel. 
pode falar, pode falar. Yes, you can speak, Lucas. Actually, I'd like to bring back some of the points. It's a pity that Mariana had to leave, but she did bring forth very interesting points, particularly when she asks, she wonders about the spectrum that's uh, involved within the idea of e-commerce. E Her answer is really incredible. This expression uh, really defines it. Actually, I'm actually going to incorporate that, uh, Sophia, because this uh, digital economy comprises all of the instruments of this economy that is uh, becoming more and more digitalized. So when we talk about digital uh, trade or e-commerce, we're talking about trading on uh, goods and services and, and data and 3D print, uh, which are realities that will become trade as a whole. So the solution offered by Sophia is really incredible and it sort of summarizes the idea of this new architecture of the digital economy, a new, a new uh, architecture of economy as a whole. And Mariana had proposed some, had proposed some interesting debates particularly by someone who's uh, uh, active uh, outside that realm, particularly when it comes to, to intellectual, artificial intellectual, we talk about this uh, regime shift as a deliberate political act in order to re reduce resistance to creating a more liberal logic, a more specific regime that will tend to, the, to some specific uh, interests. Mariana was also talking about the issues of uh, Increasing participation. I think this is a very important challenge in this dialogue with the movements around digital rights, which includes understanding the rationale of trade negotiations, how more uh, closed within themselves they are, and how how transparent they are. This is important for those who come from uh, multi-stakeholder uh, negotiation. I think we do have to interact with those movements which are active around that area for this for this dialogue that uh, have been clearly posed uh, by Gabriel in his final intermission when he's, was, he was bidding farewell to Mariana. Concerning the questions, I must admit that the first one concerning resuming the digital, in, uh, digital economy industry in Brazil, I have uh, very little to say. I do not have an answer that's ready-made for that because I think hurdles are not only regulatory Regulatory hurdles are one of the challenges to to all of these to this process of consolidating a certain model for economy. I would like to focus on another two points. The second question poses how much the Brazil-Chile agreement will uh, consolidate this uh, avenue towards the TPP model by uh, consolidated. I think Sofia mentioned that we cannot say that everything is lost. I think they are steps. Uh, significant steps uh, on a much faster avenue towards that end. We did have some declarations of people within the Ministry of Economy who have deliberately used the idea of uh, new agreements, negotiating new agreements to the possibility of uh, uh, having these new regulatory reforms and a new government. I think these are very, uh, you know, solid uh, steps, I would say it's consolidating, but we are actually paving the way, which can be very, it, it may be very costly to change position along this pathway because we're working on bilateral and regional uh, Mercosur agreement with the European Union. And now with this multilateral approach, Brazil has taken liberal positions about governmental procurement, uh, intellectual property, uh, trading services and now on uh, electronic uh, trade. Costs for political change become higher and higher uh, for us to follow along this avenue. And the third question, which is a very interesting one, concerning this major technological dispute, as Gabriel says, it encroaches the field of geopolitics. This technological dispute between the US and China, if we had gotten used to this U.S. prevalence from the point of view of mastery technology as well as their companies being you know, domineering over the sector. I think that now the wheel changes and moves in a, in a very significant way. Sophia had, uh, had, she mentioned that the main uh, power, main superpower is China. Now we have to 
look at uh, China and their policies that I'd go beyond. It's not only in terms of technological mastery or international trade, but China takes a lead uh, over the U.S. on uh, privacy and personal data protection policies. China is discussing the new regulatory framework on privacy and da personal data protection, which is superior to the U.S. because the U.S. Too does not have many. So that's prior to the debate in the U.S. So China takes the lead also in the regulatory realm on privacy and personal data protection, in addition to the technological development, which also gives it the lead in, in, in uh, artificial intelligence. Very good, Lucas. Sophia. Uh, our viewers have have shared questions which go beyond Brazil, beyond the realm of Brazil. So I'd like to hear from you. Two questions which are not simple in their own uh, way. But first of all, what is the international dispute like concerning the 5G? And what can it signify for the world we know, for the internet as, as we know it? And I'd like to know whether the general European uh, general law on data protection, whether that's the avenue towards legislation that will be protective of workers, uh, legislation that will be protective of women and other political representation minorities in Latin American countries. I'd like to know whether you think that the European general law on data protection, is that the way forward or is that not enough and there are other avenues to be pursued? Very well, let's go and uh, uh, let's take it in parts. I don't like to say that a law is the, the avenue towards anything, particularly if this law is European, in the sense that uh, each country will have its own legislation and they'll have its own history and they have the framework. Uh, uh, you mean, you know, law is not something that's studied. Uh, there's a jurisprudence, there's a uh, a case law, there's a tradition, there's a whole legislative and symbol of things. In Argentina, for instance, there's no uh, data protection law for workers. Nevertheless, we had this case where GPS was was posed or placed on workers to follow them, and they said that there was encroaching the workers' privacy and that they had to remove the bill. So laws are very dynamic and they are adjusted according to each society. Having said that, the European data protection law is very good and it protects data, even if they go beyond the European Union borders. The problem is how to, bring, to make it effective. And this is something that's being developed. Argentina has a very old data protection law. Nevertheless, it's not bad. It's very good, actually. And it's very protective of the population. This is why the debate around improving it is something like what well, was tried to, to disregard because uh, it was attempted during the Macri's administration and in fear that it, it would eventually become a more liberalizing law. That's why they decided not to advance in terms of trying to, uh, to enhance the law because as it is, it's very good. So it's better to have that than to ha than to open up the discussion and then eventually allow for a whole lot of things we we're not looking at allowing now. Nevertheless, it could be improved, and I believe that elements such as this one, which are protective of citizenship beyond the restrictions of the country, is a starting point. Nevertheless, we also have to consider that uh, international debates have to be implemented. Brazil has a lot to do in, the, in those terms because it is part of the G20, which is the issue of a uh, data paradise, such as there are fiscal paradise, there will be more and more, there are more and more data havens, which is data havens where we can position servers and we don't pay taxes. There's no protective law you can do as you please. And you have to start addressing this debate because, in many cases, data haven will go hand in hand with the data, data uh, fiscal uh, havens. If we put that together with uh, crypto coins and cryptography, 
we have an unregulated uh, digital world. That's the idea, the liberal idea, that the state is, is a problem and regulation is bad. So this is on the one hand, I believe, the European uh, normative. If it allows for one country to, to uh, take elements from that in order to prove that they're part, okay, but I wouldn't say that this is a way forward. There are interesting elements in that, and we have to start looking at our national regulations. Perhaps it should include some of those elements which we currently do not have in our societies. Having said that, the question concerning the 5G, 5G is a technology that lots of people think uh, well, is, you know, a faster uh, uh, internet, uh, telephone running fast. Actually, 5G is not that. 5G is actually going to transform the ways of production, the, the, the forms of production we have, because it will allow for smaller latency, uh, increasing the number of uh, connected uh, devices and faster internet as a third pillar that will allow for the internet of things and that will allow for real-time data processing, which takes us to uh, intelligent homes where everything I know in my life is connected to the internet. Therefore, as it is connected to the internet, it will take data from my life, it will process those data, and then it will deliver back to me consumables, products that I can consume now. So, uh, to say it in a way that we can see, it's like, uh, you know, the, the refrigerator I have at home. If this refrigerator, if I open it up, if it tells me, look, you do not have any milk, and there's this uh, milk on sale at this supermarket a couple of blocks away from home, and there's this discount coupon, and then we should think that this... Uh, uh, perhaps this uh, fridge could charge me for that use, and if I fail to to pay for that use, um, that it will no longer freeze stuff. So if the fridge is connected to the internet, that can happen, which happens today. If I stop paying for my Spotify, I cannot listen to music anymore. If I do not pay for Netflix, I won't be able to watch the movies. So what would happen if the devices we have are all around us, if they knew all of the data about our life and they would be able to deliver segmented uh, publicity or uh, advertisement according to the taste we have, like uh, we stop uh, consuming butter because we are in a diet and they could suggest stuff according to our consumption patterns. And finally, uh, the issue of authorizing us to use this, their services in, in exchange for, for a subscription. So this is what could eventually happen to us as consumers. From the productive point of view, this is also revolutionized production because as there are intelligent uh, homes, there will be intelligent factories where products will be produced in a more techno-efficient manner with more amounts of information. So uh, you have the dichotomy concerning international regulations and what can be done in terms of the state's capacity to develop uh, public policies, not only that, but also the capacity to regulate over intelligent cities. The state as the uh, a guarantee to handle a society and promote rights within a city and to ensure public uh, services within that city, how far will they have access to those data? For instance, in Argentina, we have this debate going on about the public cloud, which is we have this public uh, cloud by means of RSAT, but the the cloud capacity is uh, is going to be increased or extended to all state services and one thing in the uh, public calls they considered uh, asking for the support of amazon now is amazon going to have data to those data access to those data so that the state can develop public policies perhaps yes but if uh, e trade or uh, digital economy uh, uh, the, if those clauses are approved the, the Argentina would not be able to include that because it would be against the WTO. 5G would take this debate to another level by means of intelligent cities and handling 
population information, there will be a lot more capacity to design public policies. And this is what takes us to think about data as common goods. We should not consider data as private uh, goods or public goods because considering them as public good is a problem because if uh, we'll have a government uh, worse than governor uh, than bolsonaro's they will have access to all of our data or tastes or uh, political tendencies and advocacy and this and that and they will develop campaigns against the population we should not think about data as public or private data we should start uh, thinking about data as common goods where the population is the one the, they are owners of those data and privacy policies if this is a city if you're thinking about a, an intelligent 5g interconnected uh, um, realm citizens in this city will have the policy to have uh, interaction of with their data in order to develop better stay a better better city, better transportation, better education, better this and better that. So the population has to be consulted in terms of what they want to be done with the data. Otherwise, it would fall into authoritarianism by a state that is authoritarian or by under uh, transnational companies that handle that information and will use that for commercial purposes. We cannot allow capitalism to monetize our geolocation, our mankind, our humanity, our beings. We have already lost the capacity to have some realm of our lives which is not monetizable. And this is the debate we have to consider as uh, you know, social movements. Uh, the, the information, that's the information that uh, you, you can see coming out of uh, 5G. Excellent, Sophia. And to wrap up, to allow you to make your final uh, comments and to start uh, to say goodbye, I would like to close, to wrap up on this theme so you see if data continues to be seen as private goods, the emergence, the emergence of 5G is actually going to be negative for workers. So yeah, 5G actually depends on how society will have access and how will the law, the governments, and people will, will see those data as public goods, common public, common public goods, or as private uh, goods? Is that the way forward? Sofia? I, I, I didn't understand that the question was addressed at me. I, I apologize. I can I can ask the question in Spanish so you can make your final comments and you can say goodbye afterwards. But I would like to elaborate a little more on the 5G issue because many people has expressed um, interest in, on this theme. So from what you said, apparently, if data continue to be seen as private goods, the emergence of 5G, is it going to be structurally negative for workers? Meaning 5G quality, the 5G impacts on workers, they are closely related to the way in which uh, government and the public will, will face data, will they face them as common good or as private good? Is that the way forward, you see? I wouldn't say that uh, 5G is going to have negative impact on workers because again, uh, if we look at uh, philosophy and epistemology, all technologies is, are developed with a, an interest in mind. And the question is, what is the interest behind this technology? What if technology is going to be designed so that we become objects of consumption. Obviously, it isn't, uh, but we cannot be deterministic. This is not the only way. There are other possible uh, avenues, and we have to be very active uh, around this theme. Technology has to be, uh, for instance, I usually say that uh, can there, uh, we cannot have feminism without technology, and we cannot have technology without feminism. Technology has to be feminist, for instance, and it has to have a uh, worker's perspective, and it has to be used for um, decent jobs, for sustainability of the planet, and so on and so forth. And that's for starters. But then, uh, geopolitics of 5G, the design is offered to revolutionize the uh, 
global production chains. In that sense, 5G, I think the, main, the three main challenges for the state in terms of 5G are, first, privacy, citizen, pri citizen privacy. Yeah, it, it's a crazy thing when we started talking about digital uh, economy some 15 years ago. I was uh, referred to as uh, the crazy lady of the algorithms. Uh, and I did, I used not to pay attention to that. But nowadays, I think that nobody, not even the uh, ordinary citizens, whatever they are, they, they have they are aware that they're being surveilled and privacy is important. They may say, I do not uh, care about that. I have nothing to hide, but they know there's a problem there. They will recognize it. They will understand it. And that is, uh, you know, ground that has been gained, such as privacy is going to be the first main theme. And the second one is cybersecurity. Because passive attacks, they will think, uh, you know, Google drops or crashes and everybody goes into a crisis. Nobody can work without Google. What's going to happen if that implies that I'm not going to have access to my fridge or to my own uh, to door? if I have an electronic key with a code. So it's gonna to happen tomorrow if I cannot go in my home because uh, uh, it's, it's part of the system. Cybersecurity uh, will have a lot of, a big problem, not only for citizens, but also for the governments. And that is being seen in the uh, scandals that we see. Uh, I apologize, uh, Gabriel, I have my children here. That's why I had to, to to go, and they are the ones that are demanded because that's why I needed to go. Concerning governmental problems that are uh, posed, both in terms of uh, uh, government security and information security and so on. And the third, the third main challenge that we're going to see on the part of the state uh, under the 5G is going to be the digital uh, divide where very few will have access to that technology and they'll be able to live in a very comfortable environment, obviously highly controlled as well. And another whole bunch who will not have access to those technologies. So let's look a little farther then. Let's think about uh, uh, you know, a housewife uh, worker, somebody who works, uh, you know, um, as a cleanup lady or just uh, raising children. What's going to happen to this uh, lady if she doesn't have a digital, if she's not digitally literate, uh, where she works in an intelligent uh, um, environment where she controls all of the uh, uh, devices by means of digital control, they'll have to put codes and everything. So the digital divide is going to hit everybody. It's going to be even more difficult to, to be bridged. So our governments have this very important task to comply with. A digital divide, I usually say that in terms of education, in terms of having access to this technology, meaning the digital divide has three dimensions as I see it. One is access to a device, meaning a cell phone, a smartphone in my hands here. Now, the second thing is being able to use this cell phone. And the third dimension to it, nobody speaks about it, nobody includes that in within the digital divide issue, which is to understand what a cell phone is and to dispute that. And it's no minor theme because there's this uh, spread idea that whatever's technological is better. There are some technological devices which are faster, which are more precise and accurate, that's uh, neutral, and this and that. And citizens, at some point in time, it was a uh, you know emancipatory to learn to read and write. Nowadays, we communicate by means of those technologies, which therefore learning how you use those technologies, what they're used for, and to actually question what I'm using the proper tool and the one I have to use, that is going to be the emancipation of the future, citizens' emancipation of the future. We have to start thinking about new ways, new emancipatory ways in terms of understanding technologies because, uh, you know, like they're pushing uh, electronic uh, votes, electronic uh, casting votes. They say that's faster, it's better, we know who to vote on. And at the moment, uh, right uh, when you vote, I know the results. But uh, I have, you know, graduate studies, and I cannot enforce uh, elections when it's done um, 
over electronic means. If they say there's a fraud, a fraud, I have to believe it. So the system is not democratic because it's, it cannot be audited by citizens. This is why we have to start to challenge these technologies if we want emancipatory and independent citizenship. And if we want people to really be citizens who own their rights, who will have possession over their history and over their future. I don't know whether that uh, responds to your question, but uh, that's what I could do. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you very much for your participation. As usual, placing a lot of emphasis on central points and being very, um, reassured about what you say and uh, about the theme of uh, e-commerce. This is why, again, uh, we are having more and more live presentations with you because you, you like to elaborate on the theme. So thank you very much for your participation. And now we'll get back to Lucas to, to wrap up our presentation in, in your participation. An overall question in, to wrap up. We're going through a nightmare with the Brazilian administration, as you mentioned, when it comes to foreign trade. We did have the main turnabout in Brazilian foreign trade in the history of the country with this government, though it was democratically elected. Looking at the possibility of being able to overthrow a Bolsonarism at the end of 2022, I would like to know you from you what are the key points for international trade negotiations because of WTO, uh, di digital trade or bilateral agreements or even forums of discussion that Brazil has been participating and will participate between now and at the end of this current uh, federal mandate. Uh, and do you think that the civil society is uh, actually watching in order to be able to resist until then so that as of 2023 to try and be a part of the discussions and to stand on Brazilian positions in this area. Thank you, Gabriel, for your mediation for, for conducting this debate today. Again, I'd like to express my gratitude to Hebripi and to everybody who was with us here for these conversations we have had this afternoon. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very broad question indeed, and I have thought a lot about it. I'm working on this discipline on Brazilian foreign policy. And every class, we touch on different spe specific themes to discuss these uh, uh, turnarounds because we're talking about this particular turnaround of Brazilian foreign policy on international trade. And you know that this debate can be divided, broken down in the environment, gender, human rights, uh, culture, security, basically all of the themes in the foreign policy agenda. First, analytically, when we understand what this turnabout has meant in practical terms, and on the other hand, you have this the, the way going forward. You, you look at the possibility of returning to the previous status quo, at least, or at least to, to to sort of uh, you know, level the policies that have already been implemented. I believe, I have to admit that uh, in terms of trade, I am a little more pessimistic than I am with the other fronts. It's deliberate policy, not only coming from this current administration, obviously this current government has this an ultra liberal perspective if you have kept abreast of the news in recent weeks, as the, the CNI has saw the representatives from previous governments just questioning the unilateral opening process in the country. We're working on a certain extreme of a certain economic theory. We're already moving on on, on uh, accrued elements from a number of years now. When we have adopted liberal uh, models, now ultra-liberal in very many uh, regulatory fields of international trade, intellectual uh, E-trade, electronic uh, services, and competition areas areas that are very important, and we gradually give up without any bargaining process. This is important to be mentioned because these policies uh, they are unilateral for the country. The the country does not uh, follow, except for this one between Mercosur and the European Union. Brazil gives uh, way to the to the industry to uh, you know agricultural goods uh, being traded ab abroad many of those measures follow the neoliberal uh, 
policy in terms of developing the space of trust to attract foreign investment. This is an old discourse. Uh, we have been living with that since the 1990s. We're actually regurgitating this uh, late liberalism back s since from uh, the 1960s and 1970s in Chicago. We have this very broad pathway for advocacy, and Sophia made it very clear. I think the first task we have at hand is to try uh, and pose obstacles against these new measures along this path. First thing is to, to, to stop this, uh, this, these negotiations. Second thing is to think again about a development model to see whether we are restricted or not restricted by regulatory uh, steps uh, before the end of this administration. So the more immediate task we have at hand, which is to stop it and to counter by providing measures that will stop this process at, at this most uh, severe moment uh, when we're going through a pandemic and we have to dis discuss the role of state. We're discussing those measures not in the 1990s. We're discussing these measures in one of the worst health uh, scenarios, consequently an economic scenario, one of the worst ones from the first century and for, for, for these uh, you know, number of years after the second post-war. So, the second point is to be able to position, to take a, a propositional position in order to consider a new model for international negotiation for economic uh, uh, introduction for the country so that we can start redesigning international trade policies to recover this role Brazil has usually, usually played as a reliable negotiator. Brazil has been active in many areas such as human rights and environment and international trade. Brazil has always been seen as a real reliable negotiator in the international sphere and we have actually thrown it away, uh, no doubt about it. There's a multifaceted process which is to stop that movement and rethink strategies and to resume trust within the international uh, field in terms of the capacity to act and interact with our traditional uh, partners, particularly when it comes to the development. Oh, wonderful, Lucas, wonderful. Thanks for opening and closing uh, today's uh, live presentation. As the, uh, the author of this text that was produced for Rebrip on this theme about what position Brazil takes in international negotiations on e-commerce and uh, digital trade issue has become more and more central for Brazil and for the world in economic terms, obviously, in cultural terms as well, in terms of politics, democracy, privacy, in terms of social inequalities, uh, income concentration, and various social impacts. And within all that, foreign policy has a lot of weight. It has weight in every sector, but when, you sp when, you sp when we speak about the weight digital commerce has in the economy of every country in the world and the responsibility to establish what the avenue is going to be followed by Brazil or any other country which is given by foreign policy is a very straightforward relation. If you look at the importance of this theme in every area of society and the state and the population and the weight foreign policy has on the future and how we're going to be looking at this very clearly poses the importance of organizations such as Hebripi, which is concerned with those impacts and it's also concerned with having an advocacy on Brazilian foreign policy. So this theme has to be incorporated by Rebripi. As a matter of fact, it seems to be the natural pathway for Rebripi. We have prioritized themes that at the time, they were not uh, broadly discussed. And unfortunately, I think that digital commerce, given its importance, though there are many academic groups, very good researchers in Brazil and Latin America, they do not speak as much as necessary about it, given it the weight it has in society. So it becomes one of Rebirth's crucial theme. It has become priority and will be ever more priority as it has an impact on all areas of society. It's also related with many other agendas of our foreign policy, agendas which are also being developed by the organizations. When you think about international finance institutions, when you think about geopolitical aspects or uh, WTO aspects of intellectual property, fiscal justice, gender inequality, sustainable development. So it makes sense, a lot of sense. And I would like to express 
gratitude for your participation here and for all of the uh, all of the work and the partnership that you have uh, helping us and many other uh, Colleagues, you have been helping to drive this debate, and since this debate is in preparation for the Rebripi Assembly, it is our political desire to open up space for dialogue to start working group or any other configuration for a group that will be able to subsidize itself, as I had mentioned to Mariana. There are many NGOs working on that topic, but it's such a broad subject that uh, there are spaces which are still not explored by all of them. It would be impossible for organizations to address all of those subjects. So to bring together organizations and good people who may be unaware of some of the facets of digital economy, as well as to really consubstantiate the Brazilian foreign policy, as you said, uh, change in, in uh, uh, government would not really mean automatic change. It would be very easy that uh, if we could solve the problems we're living now through voting, we could not make any structural change. So it's crucial to continue fighting for more space and to, for having a voice and for having the content and the strength to be able to do something. Obviously, with the current administration, it would be totally impossible because of lack of democracy and technical capacity and many other things. But with other, other governments, there's nothing given, there's nothing gained, but we have to keep preparing ourselves so that we have a lot of strength and content and based on organization representing different sectors so that we can actually have an incidence on these debates. So I'd really like to thank you. It's going to be very, th very useful for our assembly a couple of weeks from now and from that assembly i do hope we have important points in terms of building a working group to be and uh, have an incidence on those strategic points in brazilian foreign policy when it comes to e-commerce as was mentioned uh, which is taking major steps that will have major impacts on every sector of society once again i'd like to thank you lucas looking forward to take the two shots of our vaccine and that we will be able to see in person with a little more human warmth and less Bolsonarism in this country. Yes, we will see each other soon. I would like to express my gratitude for your kind words. And again, I'm very uh, looking forward to keep working together with you. Thank you, all of you who have uh, participated in the organization, Felipe, Graciela, translators who have who perform a very difficult job and very tiring. I would like to thank you for your work, and we will see each other.